uh, and I would skip that up. step. Uh, again, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, how was lunch? You all falling asleep? Do we need to like get up and do a little dance or something? <laughs> um, well, again, happy to have you here today. We will be talking about accessibility audits and the many shapes and sizes that they take. So apologies, I'm just bringing this over to do a reset. Don't mind me. How do you get this? Good, perfect, we're pausing while everybody gets settled. There you go, uh, thank you. Okay, cool, Kathy, go ahead and take it away. All right. Technical difficulties. Um, my name's Kathy Beck. I'm a senior UX engineer at UN. I've been at UN for nine years, working on a lot of different projects. Um, I'm primarily working in Drupal sites, site building, and theming. I've also joined our company's DEI advisory board and became an accessibility subject matter for the company. I started building in Drupal back in 2006 with versions 4, 7, and 5, and that's uh, close to two decades ago, so now you know my age. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> my first accessibility project was in 2017, but I've been around folks with limited vision and others who are blind since I was a little kid, so you can probably say I'm uh, I became empathetic and sensitive to others' needs. Um, and being a developer, I'm constantly using autocomplete, tabbing through forms, um, and I was an avid reader, uh, and now I listen to audiobooks all the time, uh, so I can have my hands free to do dishes and fold laundry and garden and things like that. <laughs> All right, so I am Julie Elman, Senior Digital Project Manager. I've been with UM for going on eight years now. Worked very closely with Kathy for all of these years. We've been on numerous projects together. We're on the same squad, so we just matriculate through the system together. Um, I shared with Kathy the first uh, remediation project in 2017. It was a very different landscape than it is now. It's wonderful to see everybody sitting here and being interested in accessibility and pushing forward and obviously seeing a lot of faces here of people that gave accessibility talks to is encouraging. Um, so I actually started my career slash education in culinary arts and then moved on from that into graphic design and finally landed in project management. Um, but paying homage to my time as a budding chef um, you'll notice a little bit of a culinary flair to some of the slides, just to bring that in. And for me, also surrounded by different people with different levels of impairments. Um, my grandfather had a lot of challenges with vision. Um, we also worked with a legally blind colleague, so got a lot of professional experience working to understand what some of the accommodations were that he would need to be successful as a back-end engineer. My most used accessibility feature is uh, Speechify, which is just an extension uh, that you can get, or I think you, you can also get it as an app for your phone, and basically listen to any article that you're interested in for free for a limited number of articles. Um, I live for this. So when I have a long article, article to read or a long contract, I'm able to do that while I'm folding laundry, as Kathy said, doing something a little bit more mindless, but able to get some energy out and still be really productive. So um, let's talk a little bit more about what we're gonna discuss today. So we're basically aiming for everyone in this room to feel empowered by the end of this session, to have the tools that you need to, to run your own audit or understand what you would need to do in order to work with somebody to successfully run an audit. So to do that, we are going to talk about the components of an audit. What do you need to be successful? Um, different audit sizes. So we've just generally categorized them based on our experiences, but audits can literally take any shape and size um, depending on what you choose to prioritize and, and what type of standards you need to um, actually adhere to. We'll talk about the audit deliverables, which we have certain deliverables that we provide. Um, we were just talking to Matthew over there and Matthew was sharing us a different deliverable and it, it can be any any, sh any shape, any size for even deliverables, as long as you are giving something actionable 
to the web owner or the people that are going to be making the adjustments. Um, we'll talk about audit remediations as well. We're a full service digital agency, so we do remediations after we do audits, and it's really important to us to build with accessibility in mind. And then after the initial audit, this is actually keeping the content on the site accessible and making sure that you're testing. So we'll dig into these in a little bit more detail through case studies of our experiences and the arch of our knowledge and really gathering all of this knowledge that we'll be sharing um, over the last six years. And then we also have a QR code at the end of the presentation that will take you to a document where we've provided a lot of different resources that you can leverage and a copy of the slide deck will also be in there. All right, so just like uh, all websites, Accessibility audits are not the same. So I'm just curious, um, obviously there's a lot of different tools that you can use to build your site. Is it decoupled? Are you using JavaScript? Are you using Drupal? Is it a different CMS? Um, who do we have in the room? We're curious just to get experience and like knowledge of people's uh, you know, impressions of audits. So has anybody here worked on an accessibility audit before? Nice, nice, see five, six hands, that's awesome. Um, does anybody have one coming down the pipeline? All right, awesome. Probably equal hands, and then anybody um, who's just generally interested or having, nope, I already touched on that. All right, I think we've got it. Anybody currently working on one? Can I ask? Nice. I have two. <laughs> okay, well, this should help. Yes. Awesome. All right, so components. Um, this is where we'll start to break it down into a little bit more detail. So it's, it's the you, it's the people who are maybe engineers, your project managers, you're going to be involved as a website owner or a stakeholder. Um, you need to understand who's gonna be involved. That's who you're gonna loop in along the way. Um, then you need to ask some really critical key questions that help you refine, actually, what are you building? And this can define for you the size of your audit. So um, the first one being the scope and the focus. So that really is what are you trying to strive for as far as compliance? Um, and you can think about this for section 508, it could be WCAG 2.1, just recently released WCAG 2.2. Is it that you're thinking about the admin experience? Are you thinking about screen readers? All of these things matter and will help you to understand um, where you need to put in the time and attention. The next thing that you need to think about is your timeline and budget. Um, so is there any reason that you need to get this done by a certain date? Um, you'll hear in one of our future case studies that one of our clients actually had to do a reactive audit um, because there was a case opened up against them. So they needed to remediate in a certain duration of time. Some folks are very lucky, don't have that predicament. They can be much more proactive about it, um, but it just depends on the situation. And also maybe budgetary could be based on your fiscal year, so you need to figure out um, how much time and money can you invest uh, with what team. Next is deciding on the tools, which Kathy will walk us through in much more detail um, so that you can walk away with just a baseline knowledge of the tools that we like to leverage and that we would recommend others also check out. And then uh, deliverables and documentation, which Kathy will also walk us through. And finally, remediation, which is making those code-based changes, content-based changes, and just generally making sure that the site is um, up to par. So over to Kathy. Audit testings can, can include a combination of tools and services uh, that can be used by you or a partner, partnering agency. Uh, to create a rapport of accessibility issues that need to be remedi remediated. Um, this is probably how you are used to or used to seeing these tools and services broken out and categorized. Manual versus automated, paid versus free, Mac versus Windows, software, apps. Uh, we wanted to think about these tools and services differently and we kept coming back to it depends on your skill level or what is the level of effort you can dedicate to this tool or service? And, and that information varies with each person and project. So these are official statistics. This is uh, me and Julie's opinion on where the Official beginner, statistics you know. based off of our preferences, yes. Um, if you're new to accessibility, you can see we have a bunch of automated services and manual tools that you can start with. Uh, you have Lighthouse, Axe, Site Improve, uh, Level Access, uh, Digital Allies. 
Uh, then you have like keyboard navigation, your more manual tests, testing color contrast, reading levels, uh, accessibility trees, wave and spectrum. Um, but then once you uh, get comfortable with running tests, you and your company might invest in some more intermediate and more advanced tools that might cost uh, more effort, more money. Um, and similar in tech in our industry, accessibility services um, follow the same ongoing improvements and releases. New tools are always coming out. Um, and just return to old tools to see uh, what's changed. Um, has your skill set increased? Is it less of a barrier to entry to get into these tools? Um, and then after running your test, you'll need to document your findings. Um, and even like this conference has introduced a number of new tools to us, like Dubbot, yeah. like that so was a great one. I actually got Dubbot and Sally up there from, I believe, your, your uh, talk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, the <laughs> new tools coming out all the time. Um, so this document can come in the form of many things. Uh, for us, we use a VPAT, which is a voluntary product accessibility template. And this might be things you've heard in RFPs or, or different contractual um, talks of this is what we need from you. Um, and this comes from the physical product space. So when you're looking at this document, you want to remember your website is your product. Um, and VPATs can be self-completed by you or a partner agency, um, and it serves as a visual representation of your commitment to your website's accessibility efforts. Um, it can also serve your teams as a roadmap for future work, because as you fill out your VPAT, uh, you'll be indicating if the criteria supports, partially supports, or does not support that, that standard or criteria. Um, and along with the information, you can provide dates that you're, you're striving for completion or links, since we're in the Drupal space, we have uh, Drupal issue queues, so we can link to the public link that says the community is working on this. And then annually, you can come back and revisit this document. Um, a v might, VPAT might not be a binding legal document, but it does show your best intentions, and, and that can be valuable. All right, so yes, um, essentially I alluded to it with the remediation, but running an audit the way that we're positioning it is just step one, like basically figuring out what might be going on with your site, where do you have room for improvement, and then you need to start to think about what's to come, how can we make this any better for our site and actually make those changes to move towards accessibility and accessibility compliance. So we've put together just like a mock timeline, so there's probably little chance that you're going to get everything done in the course of six weeks. Uh, but basically, there's steps here that you should follow. You complete your audit, you're gonna meet with your team, you're gonna review the findings, you're gonna talk a little bit about the level of effort to complete them. We heard about a quick framework for prioritizing your issues, like how widespread of an impact is it to users? Is it one of your key site functionalities that people can't convert? Um, you need to think about the impact of where you're spending your time and then work on a remediation plan. So this is really when you're like, all right, let's start planning, let's have these resources, these team members spend X amount of time working on the solution. And it may be that you're um, fortunate enough to have a contract that allows you to do it in a lump sum. You may also have a client or you yourself only have the budget to spend 30 to 40 hours per month. So you need to prioritize what you're working on accordingly. Now, a lot of the issues that you will see, um, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but like we've just broken out kind of the top five that can be key contributors to accessibility not being met for certain standards. 
And then once you've done these remediations, you deploy them, you go through the QA testing process, you just retest and repeat uh, because this is an ongoing experience. You need to keep up with accessibility. We can't say it enough. Tools change, standards change. You've got to just implement some sort of process that works for you. Um, for some of our clients, it's quarterly. Other clients, it's annually. It just depends on, again, what you have the budget for. So what does remediation look like? Yeah, this is a much more detailed list of, of the types of things that can happen for you. Um, it may be colors. You may just have a color scheme that doesn't work for users. It could be yellow and white, and that's just not going to work together unless it's really, really large. Um, so you have to think about adjustments to the color schemes and design. Um, authored content, we've heard a lot about this. How do you keep your content accessible editorially? was something that had come up earlier. Um, as just like an implementation on Drupal to flag to your users, you've just introduced a regression that's causing you a little bit of a ding towards accessibility, you should fix it. Um, and, and basically just empowering users to sustain the remediations that we work so very hard on um, to make sure are in place from a technical standpoint, but it's very quickly thrown off when the content gets um, entered in a way that's not accessible. And then I will say the other thing that often stands out to us is the third party in embeds. These can cause a lot of challenges, um, like social media embeds, not having alt text when it comes to Instagram. These are some really core key challenges that um, we're frankly still working on good solutions for to make sure that they're accessible and available to end users. If you're gonna put it on your site, whether it's a PDF, whether it's content, or maybe it's even like a subdomain. If it's within your domain, it is within the realm of your website, and if it was not accessible, somebody had an issue, you could ha have legal repercussions. So it's really, really important to think about everything as a whole, even if you're just the, I don't know, administration or you know admissions department. If your portion of the site's accessible, that's really great. You're gonna get people to apply, but somebody could be looking for some sort of, um, financial aid form, and if that's not accessible, they may have to forcibly make a claim because they want to go to your college and they can't. Um, the other thing that's really worth mentioning since we're at more of like a state governmental uh, conference is the fact that Colorado is going to be the first state to require by law that state agencies are actually compliant with website standards. So the timeline for this is coming up very quickly. Um, it's July of next year. so. Um, Definitely those folks are gonna to need to start thinking about this, but I would see that like this is the beginning of the wave of a lot of other states probably jumping on board and really um, making this more of a, a standard. And the cautionary tale, we were having a good chat with somebody about this earlier today, where like tools like Accessibility, they can promise you that they're gonna make your site accessible, but that's truly not what happens. It can actually introduce more challenges for a user. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it most likely is. Our mantra here is actually get to the source, make the fix, because it's worth the investment, particularly because the investment that you make to fix something is gonna be far lower than if you end up with some sort of legal repercussions. All right, um, let's get you started with what you can do right away. So basically, back to Kathy's point of intent and making sure that you have the intention of making your site accessible. Um, there are a couple of, of quicker things that you can do if you're a content admin to start opening up the uh, fluid communication lines between your users and uh, your website. So the first thing is just having a web accessibility statement or page on your site, and we've just provided some draft language that you can use to basically um, express your commitment to this. And then not just that, but we wanna make sure that you're also opening up the, the door to the communication and that you're open to feedback because um, that's really important. And if you don't offer somebody the opportunity to provide feedback directly on your site, who knows where they might take that information if they're very frustrated. So um, we often recommend like a su submit an accessibility form that is accessible. So make sure that your form is structured correctly and has the correct title tags and groupings. Um, or it could just even be as simple as submit an email to and make it a very understandable link and then just have an email form pop up so that they can send an email along. All right. Technology is growing, I mean, accessibility is evolving 
and that means we are continuously learning. We have been working in accessibility since 2017, and the information around web content and accessibility guidelines has truly come a long way. And the pace in which the information is getting updated is extremely impressive. <clears throat> Speaking of coming a long way, WCAG 2.2 was released earlier this month. Uh, Julie and I attended a webinar earlier this week called What's Different with WCAG 2.2. Um, this webinar was put on by the Atten Group and there was a lot of great information shared there and it was free. So uh, that was awesome. We learned about the nine new criteria being added, which uh, focuses on low vision, uh, cognitive impairments, and limited fine motor skills. Um, they are also removing a HTML parsing criteria. And we can just like look at this map. This map is available to on our resources. This shows you like the four key, the four standards. Um, it is just so incredible how complex the WCAG stan standards are getting. Um, so this helps to visualize it, but also there's a lot of tools that you can use on, on the web to better understand this when it comes to your site or if you're focusing on key functionality that you can check out and start to see which of the standards and criteria will apply. Uh, shout out to Intopia for this graphic. Um, yeah. It's extremely cool. I wouldn't want to be the one designing it though because it keeps getting more complicated. <laughs> Um, so we started working in the accessibility space back in 2017 and things were a lot different back then. Um, here you can see example of the W3's WCAG standards page from back then, here on the left, um, and um, we're guessing there's about 5% more. 4.5 times. Times amount of content in today. nowadays which is just mm -hmm. like this is where we started you would try and go and get your information it was a very different landscape than nowadays where it really has become more accessible for you to get the information on how to be accessible mm -hmm. so we should all be doing this yep and WCAG's uh, providing so much more information the information is human readable uh, useful samples and code solutions um, if we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll take a little um, demo of some of my favorite features in that section right now. Um, before we get into our case studies, just a quick note, some of our client business and partner names have been redacted due to contractual agreements. Um, so our first case study will look at a national healthcare provider. Uh, this was our first accessibility project we had been working with this on this project for a few years uh, when we started a proactive accessibility audit remediation with a partnering audit agency. For this initiative, we were aiming for level AA compliance. The project started in 2017 and lasted for nine months. The tools the partnering agency were testing, using for testing were SortSight, JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, ZoomText, and PDF remediation through Adobe Acrobat. And just to add here that there was a crash course in uh, like the communication between us and the partner requ was requiring such that there were so many issues that we had to learn these tools um, so that we could kind of self audit it before we sent it back to them. We learned after a couple tries that because they would just tell us you have this issue now go figure it out and there were no resources on the web that we had to understand now how to replicate it. And Kathy can now use JAWS and NVDA. I didn't pick up that skill, but like keyboard tabbing, I can do that. Um, but it's it's just incredible. The, that's that like level of, of knowledge and kind of the gateway for entry that not everybody has those skills. Um, so chat with Matthew too if you need if you need some specialized auditors because yeah they they are incredible when it comes to actually testing in real time things that we will never catch as sighted users. Uh, like, like Julie said, we were very new to accessibility at this point, but we did have the, the website knowledge. We had been working in that space. We built the site three years prior. Um, and being a pro 
active audit, um, there was a reduced pressure of a deadline and we were able to work within the client's monthly budget. Um, our biggest limitation was the lack of knowledge and the information out on the internet. Um, you can see our key learnings here. This is where we learned that VPATs were could, or could be a deliverable um, and that just like Drupal, there are many, many, many ways to fix accessibility issues. Um, and uh, if you have PDFs, they need to be just as accessible as website content. Yeah, and just a side note on that too, like there are there are services that will remediate your PDFs for you, but sometimes they can charge you seven dollars per page. So if it's a two hundred page, you are nodding, everybody's nodding. Yeah, it's like if it's a two hundred page PDF, that's a lot of money. And really, like we would recommend flipping it on its head, make it accessible during the design phase and the creation phase as much as possible, because. Educating that person first means you're saving yourself countless versions of that PDF. Heaven forbid a period get added somewhere or a typo be fixed, you're starting over again. Um, so that's definitely something that all of our client projects have had to learn from and evolve through. Uh, on to our second case study, uh, we will look at a higher ed uh, nonprofit college audit. Uh, for this initiative, we were aiming for double A compliance again. Uh, the project was started in 2020 and it lasted 12 months for remediation. Uh, we did not build this site. We did not know the file structure, the, the content models in Drupal. Um, so there was a project learning curve for our team here, even though our accessibility knowledge was a lot higher at this point. Uh, the tools that the Department of Education, uh, who was our auditor, used were keyboard navigations, color contrast, and then just the accessibility tree review. Um, they, they looked at the code more so than running reports. Mm -hmm. um, um, like I mentioned, we had now had advanced accessibility knowledge and experience, um, and being a React so this was a reactive uh, audit, which meant we had a deadline um, to meet, which meant we had to be very intentional with the client's monthly budget, which wasn't... Extensive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so our biggest challenge with this remediation um, was actually third-party embeds. Um, if it's embedded in your site, you are responsible for the accessibility of it. Um, if you can't fix it and it's a major issue, potentially link off site and then it stays with that vendor because it's under their domain, not under your, your domain. <clears throat> and the key learnings here was uh, to have that report and accessibility, get that out there in front of users as soon as possible. And if you know your audience and your content, you can really focus your testing time. Um, you can pick those key pages that 80% of your, your users are going to and really focus your remediation there. Um. Yeah, and one other thing just about the third party, if, if you are really incorporated with another partner, you may also want to suggest that they work on their accessibility if it is a tool or some sort of script that you're embedding that you're not responsible for. If you do not want to either capture it as an exception, which you can do in your VPAT, um, but if it really is critical key site functionality, it's the conversion for your user, you want your user to be able to actually complete that action. So you're only, you're only hindering yourself, your success, if it's not accessible. There was also, yeah, a great, a great slide, again, Matthew, like, good thing that this was fresh in our mind. Um, anybody could require some accessibility. If you come in the house and you're looking for groceries, but you realize you need to do something on your computer, you may have one arm. If you fall down snowboarding, I did, broke my arm, I couldn't use my, my right arm, and that was my primary dominant hand. So for six, I don't know, six to ten weeks, I was kind of, like, unable to use a computer well because I had a cast on, it was uncomfortable. Like, 
anybody in this room could require some of these accessibility standards um, and to be able to achieve their, their tasks and their goals. So finally, um, this one is, is kind of the culmination of a lot of the knowledge that we learned, just one example. Um, but we got to work with the state of Rhode Island on ri.gov. And this was a proactive uh, design, build, and, and maintenance in some cases, um, which enabled us to really start from where we would always recommend. It becomes the best case scenario when you're in control from the start. Our designers know accessibility. Um, they're testing with color contrast ratio tools. Um, they're testing, and Kathy's testing with keyboard na navigation, other tools. And just thinking about accessibility through all phases just ensures that if you missed it in one phase, you'll catch it in the next, um, rather than trying to completely renovate like an existing structure, um, you're able to actually build it to spec, which is a lot better. And uh, it was also a distribution. So this was gonna have really wide reach. It was really important that we actually invest good time in uh, developing it right, because it was gonna, it was gonna impact all of Rhode Island's population, which is over a million people. We're tiny, uh, but still a good amount of folks that will be using any of the Rhode Island State Organization sites. So right now we're at about 50 sites. We'll show design in a little bit. Um, but we were actually the consultant here. Um, we did the web audit and design and the development. Um, so it was really streamlined because our team would just pop something back over to the other team if we found an issue. Um, so, yeah, I've already spoiled it. We were the knowledge subject matter experts here, uh, but it was, it was a great experience for us and definitely um, with Pattern Lab for the design and Site Factory for creating the 50 sites and they just keep coming, um, it's, it's been really productive. So the upsides, our team really knew to think about accessibility. There were plenty of people to consult with. Kathy and I actually were not directly involved in this build, but because there's so much conversation across the community in our own company, we knew a lot about what was happening here and Kathy would be pulled in as a subject matter expert to make sure that things were on track. So it's really good stuff here. And the timeline was much quicker um, because we had had a lot of experience um, doing the accessibility portion. So I believe it was about like seven months, honestly, for up to, so to MVP. MVP was four for the COVID-19 information site. And yeah. then they were able to ro start rolling out the other ones three months later. Impressive. So, like, yeah, we ended up with an interesting situation here where, yeah, we were going to sign on March 10th, 2020, which was, like, <laughs> the cusp of everything, uh, you know, happening with the pandy. Um, so, at this point, we had to rush for the COVID-19 site because the state of Rhode Island is in a panic. We all want information. Let's get it done. Um, so that was really the approach that we took here. And the accessibility throughout all phases was just efficient. Um, and so we would recommend this for anybody who has the opportunity. Otherwise, you got to get a little bit more granular with it um, rather than thinking about it from a holistic standpoint, which was an incredible opportunity to have. So these are some of the designs. Um, there were So we planned for a light mode and dark mode, which is helpful for users of, of all kinds, all abilities. Um, and then there were five color schemes. So we designed for uh, WCAG AA compliance, but when it actually came to the fonts and the consideration of the state of Rhode Island and our population, uh, performance was also really key. So this is actually pretty uh, simple as far as it comes from a development standpoint. Like we really focused on simple CSS and HTML, limiting on the JavaScript because we wanted to make sure that um, since so much of the traffic was on mobile, we wanted to make sure that the site was going to be performant for them. So these are just a variety of the different color schemes in motion, which could switch between light, dark, and always remain actually at the AAA compliance level. So really striving for the best we could do there. And then just some other screenshots of the user experience, but this one stands out to me for sure. Um, this was the accessibility control panel that the team implemented, um, which will allow a user actually to set their line height, the font size, without really overlaying any sort of like external tool or something that claims like it's making the site accessible. It's just adjusting the code to what somebody needs to be able to, to navigate through the platform. All right, so next steps. Let's set you up for success and decide what's the right platform for you. So 
These are, this is where we kind of put our own flavor on the sizes. Um, it will be what you see as the right size for you. Um, but in the lower right or left corner rather, we've got the small, which is the self audit and automated testing suite. So it's basically like, what is the lowest barrier for entry that you can actually implement on your own and at least start a direction. So if you don't have a full development team or you don't have a team that will support the accessibility audit, just get it started. Um, Cause you can flag that to some of your higher ups and you can start to say, hey look, like I found these issues. It's clear that this could impact somebody. Let's start thinking about it and you might find yourself with a little bonus budget um, to apply towards that. Um, these kind of get a little bit more cumulative. So the medium could contain your self audit and if you are lucky and you get a good amount of money to support um, what you're working on or time in your plan, then you could also work on more testing. You could do manual, automated. You could even create a VPAT for yourself, which is what we're suggesting as a takeaway, but there are so many alternatives here. And even some of the systems like Dubot or Site Improve, even just those dashboards that you get for the level of accessibility can be a really great tool to just track and monitor your progress. And then finally, the large, which the key here is that there's actually remediation involved. Um, so so extensive manual testing, testing against JAWS and VDA, uh, keyboard testing, all sorts of tools like that, maybe voiceover. Um, you are going to actually include in this the, the next steps. Let's work on the issue review and estimations and start to understand the path forward. Um, work on those functionality remediations and then have your ongoing plan for maintenance and ongoing support of the accessibility initiatives and compliance. So these are the questions. This kind of ties back to the key components that we discussed earlier. So we know you have the people um, who's, who's going to be involved. Is it you leading it? Is it that you have some partners you can work with? The scope and focus. Uh, the motivator is kind of what we're calling that proactive reactive. Like do you have this opportunity that you can just get started chipping away? Or is there actually a reason that you need to push the pedal to the metal to get accessible? Which Colorado State agencies are going to need to start doing immediately. Um, the key focus areas of the website. So that's. Oh, Bye, Mom Bomo. See you later. Um, <laughs> so the key focus areas of your website are those key areas for conversion. What are people coming to the site to actually do? So if you don't understand those, you won't understand how much of an issue a certain piece of functionality not working is. Who's your audience? What's the size of your audience? What's the impact? What's your total budget when we move into the budget time frame? Um, how much time do you have to complete it? We talked on that for, for the scope and the motivator. And then how custom is your site? Because we've also been through an experience. Our healthcare provider had a super custom site, lots of custom modules, much, much more complicated to think about that and all of the forms that they had than for a more simple platform that you could build with accessibility in mind. Um, and then finally, these last three tools and processes, what's your knowledge? What's your access to services? Some of the tools are paid. Do you have a budget for that? Can you support that? Um, and then the audit deliverable, VPAT, accessibility statement, just again, providing that intent. And like if you ever had a legal claim come up, having a VPAT can be valuable just to say, we, we've been working on this and like we are still going to try to work on this. So like, thank you for flagging that. Um, and obviously handling the legal process as you need to. And finally, the audit remediation. So can you do the work yourself or do you need somebody else to help? We would love to help. Um, but obviously, if you have a team, just these tools can help them as well to, to bring your site into accessibility. So that brings us to our resources. Um, I've already promised this book to Matthew, but this was a little bit of a giveaway. Um, I just read this book, Disability Visibility, highly recommend. Um, and if you can get the QR code from where you're sitting, this is a link to a much more robust list of resources. So um, things about training, uh, the slide deck, and all of these other, like the PDF, book. PDF remediation. About so. seven articles on PDF remediation. Yeah, so are there any immediate questions? Okay, Ben. Um, other than Adobe Acrobat, is there any way or any better program to Oh, do we, okay, so there was a tool that we used to use called Pack 3 but when I put Kathy on the hunt for the resources, it seemed like they were not 
the, the tool has possibly rebranded. Yeah, and there's potentially behind services they offer now okay. versus a free tool in itself. Um, but we have like a whole remediation guide, which isn't part of the resources right now, but that's something that we can absolutely okay. add there because okay. it does go over some of the other support tools. Yeah. Because I mean, I've been remediating, remediating PDF files for like a few months now, and mm -hmm. it's just like, I'm getting better at it. Yep. But there are definitely problems. Like if there's some of the, if tagging is done in mm -hmm. The tagging structure. Like you have to go back to, you have to like save incrementally when mm -hmm. you're tagging. Exactly. Because like there is no one doing it. Yep. And it can like uh, mess everything up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah, we will add that. Um, this is one of the tools. There's so many. Um, we also had one of our UX engineers who was working on remediating PDFs for one of these projects take just a LinkedIn learning course and it was remediating PDFs. Like, I don't know, it was like the mid-level skill set. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that she found that incredibly helpful as well. Cool. Um, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the light, dark mode? Yes. Uh, is that like AAA, AA, single A? Triple A. Okay. Yes. Uh, and so what kind of tools uh, pick up on that? Like, like more uh, like non-text? Non to, uh, to see the contrast? No, we'll just flag that, that you, you know, like this is missing. Oh, like the, the contrast isn't sufficient type of thing? Well, the, 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 well, the modes. So whether the site has the light mode, dark mode, both or not. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, like identifying whether or not you're looking at a site that will support it? Yeah. I don't know that. Is Does anybody else know? Do you know? Dark Reader is an extension you can have. Dark Reader? Okay, so if you want dark mode but it doesn't support it, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, check out Dark Reader. I did hear that mentioned in an earlier presentation. Also, oh, your presentation. Yeah. Yes, it was yours. <laughs> you can also just mess with your site settings. I'm sorry, your system settings, and change it to dark mode to see. And can what you the site looks like? Can you override it? Like, let's say dark mode, there was insufficient contrast in the first place. Can you override the colors that it gives you? And Windows. And Windows. Maybe with the not not Android, potentially. With a what? Android because there are like color options now. Okay. Well, and I think Chrome just updated too. Yeah. Like, we, like a few days ago. Just don't Good job, Chrome. Use QR codes in dark mode. Oh <laughs> yeah. It does not mean the same thing. <laughs> the uh, dark mode emulator it doesn't work perfectly. Mm -hmm. They that out, so it's better to use something like Dark Reader or your own system settings than it is. To okay. Use awesome. Thank you. Any other questions before we jump into some quick demos? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Yeah, Kathy, take it away. We'll share um, a few things. Yeah. Can I, will we mm -hmm. be able to get that QR code later? Uh, we'll pull it back up. Okay. Yeah, that, absolutely. So, oh, did I not mirror? I thought I mirrored. You might have just swapped. All right, live demo. And we've got just a couple of minutes. So, if you haven't seen uh, what a sort of site report looks like, uh, you might not, because this is one of those paid services that you have to read. It's a higher knowledge level, and um, uh, I would it, say it's beefy. <laughs> yeah, it's beefy. Um, so I did a partial scan on w3.org. I own. You have a lot of. Um, options here, you can capture errors, accessibility, compatibility, search, standards, <laughs> usability. You have settings here around links, um, how many to follow externally, um, how long pages should, should you capture timeouts, things like that. Um, I just did accessibility real quick to see how your report might look from sort site. So they break it down to single A, double A, triple A. Um, and then you, you'll get um, the standard that's being flagged, the URL. I've only had it sh show me one or two URLs. Uh, you can change that to be like 50, so all 50 pages or something might get listed here. Uh, it gives you the link into the markup to see exactly what they're flagging. Um, I do find that source site does throw some false positives. They'll, they'll get in your CSS and be like, mm, bold should really be strong. Like, do you, you want to make a content 
emphasis and I'm like, stay on my CSS, please. <laughs> um, so, so that's sort of at a high level to give, give you folks uh, an idea of what you might see in there. Um, this is a shameless plug for us. On a hack day for the company, we went in and uh, created this color contrast um, thing. And I'm going to grab a list of brand colors. And then you can see I have like just white written. Um, then I have some RGBA here. So I'm gonna just paste that. You can also upload a file um, to get these ratios. And you can, s what it will do is compare itself to your light setting and your dark setting, but then also compare the colors within your list to each other to see which one gives you the greatest um, ratio setting. Where's my mouse? Um, Real quick, you can see this this white on orange is, is failing at AAA. Uh, we've noticed that you can come in here and adjust some of the hues, saturations. Um, a little, nope, I want it to go up. Nope, I'm going down. <laughs> so if we go up, oh, no, this is as far as I can go, so we'll... Start adjusting this one. And this is used heavily by our design team. Like they were actually the ones that this was this was built for. Um, built by our director of design and UX. I think Kathy, you were involved. Like there were a number of people involved, and this has taken a series of evolutions into what it is today. Uh, we're at time. Yeah, we are. But this is yeah, so this it is lets a, you adjust your brand color just slightly and it gives you a new uh, hex value. So if you just need your link color to be a little bit different and this is, is not noticeable that it's just slightly darker, um, this will help you get to that. Um, do you and want to do a quick pass through? Yeah, I was just going to say. Also, WCAG quick reference is awesome. Um, so you have these filters here. You can change the version, but then these tags are super helpful, kind of blurry is, right here. Yeah. This so <laughs> if you click menus and navigation, now you have all the criteria that you should be testing against for menus and navigation. Um, and once you get in there, I'm sorry for, <laughs> they, they give you um, how to test for sufficient, how to test for failures. There's a ton of information here on W3 under the W uh, AI section. So, uh, again, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> you want to pull up those slides again? All right, any questions after that? I know we're like beyond time. Yes? Uh, do you have any tool recommendations for um, reviewing pages that are Does SwitchSite have the off coverage now? Um, there, there are tools. I definitely saw in a demo, Dubbot can do it. You just uh -huh. put into the authentication information. Mm -hmm. I For source site, we would like manually do the authentication step with, within source site. Come on up. We'll, we'll chat with you up here. Because is it is it behind like?